Aviatech, aerospace consulting for emerging markets. All right, I'm just going to introduce the next speaker. We have Todd from Aviatech, one of the new speakers. We'll hear about China. Welcome, Todd. Thanks. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with you all today at the Speed News Conference. Uh, thank you, Joanna, for giving us the opportunity to speak. Uh, today we're going to be discussing China's aerospace industry. There are three main points we're going to cover in the presentation. Uh, first, we'll address what is the corporate strategy of AVIC Group. Second, we'll do an outlook on civil aircraft, civil aircraft engines, and general and business aviation aircraft. And we'll finish with some conclusions on the risks and opportunities of doing business in China. So let's start with AVIC Group strategy. Many of you are probably already working a lot with AVIC. Uh, it's not a simple uh, organization. It's a very, very large state-owned company which controls most of the aerospace business in China. Uh, there are over 400,000 employees and hundreds of subsidiaries. Uh, within the group, uh, for those of you not familiar, there are several divisions that are important, uh, AVIC General Aviation, AVIC Aircraft, AVIC Helicopter, AVIC Engine, and each of these divisions has different subsidiaries within, within them who you probably uh, engage with in some of your uh, business. So what we're going to look at here is the strategy, the strategic direction of AVIC Group as defined by Lin Zomin, the president of AVIC. Now Chinese is a very uh, special language. You can say a lot, you can express a lot with only a few words, um, but as many of you uh, have probably seen on business trips to China, when you directly translate Chinese into English, it can result in some pretty, uh, pretty funny translations. So if you directly translate the strategy here, it's called two integrations, three objectives, five changes, one trillion. So it doesn't mean much when you just look at it like that, but what we're going to do today is explain to you what it is that they, what is their vision, what is their strategy, and what this really means. So we'll start with what is called Liang Rong, two objectives. So AVIC Group is trying to embrace globalization, but also continue to invest in their own local clusters. So this means they want to integrate their subsidiaries in the global supply chain in both sales and in procurement. They want to integrate their subsidiaries with the local economies. So in Shenyang and Harbin, uh, they want to integrate with those companies to create aerospace clusters. The second component of the strategy is called Sanxin, and this means that there are three new objectives which AVIC has to replace their old objectives, which were previously defined as capital, management, and technology. So today, what they're trying to achieve is creating brand value, commercializing operations, and empowering the group. So we could spend two days talking about AVIC because it's such a big company, but what we're going to do is drill down on a few key uh, sections of their strategy. So we'll look at what they mean by empowering the group. Historically, China's aviation industry uh, was an industry where there was very little communication, very little collaboration between uh, the various companies under AVIC or its predecessors. So if there was a new engine program being developed in China, uh, Shenyang, uh, Liming, Guizhou Liang, Chengdu Engine Center, none of them would communicate very well with each other or collaborate on R&D uh, in order to reach a, a common goal. Today that's changing. Um, and furthermore, what used to happen was a lot of the uh, external uh, engagements were consolidated in the hands of one or two few companies, such as CADIC. So today, 
what they want to do is they want to empower those subsidiaries or those divisions to go out on their own and encourage international co cooperation, uh, encourage uh, working with external suppliers, partners, and also encourage uh, collaboration within the group. And they have several reasons for why they're going to do that. So what we can do is look at a specific case study on how the strategic shift affected uh, actual uh, implementation. So this example here, this case study, shows the previous relationship between one of the major aircraft OEMs and uh, Avit Group. Uh, so previously, the OEM's China office, AVIC International and AVIC uh, factory subsidiary, were in three-party contract. So all of the responsibility for the customer relationship, uh, international, international procurement, um, was handled by AVIC International, or its predecessor at the time, CADIC. Um, also, the terms of the contract were DDU Europe, or US. Uh, still, all of the production, the assembly, and some of the local procurement was handled by those AVIC factories. Um, but how did the change in strategy of AVIC uh, affect this type of arrangement? Well, what we see today, or since 2010 for this specific case study, is that the aircraft OEM further localized their presence in China, so they set up a much more significant procurement function. They established their own logistics hub. And now they're contracting directly with the AVIC subsidiaries. And the terms of their contract are now FCA, so they have better visibility and transparency on where their costs are in doing business with China. And the AVIC factory is, uh, and when we talk about this, we're talking about the very subsidiaries such as AVIC Shenyang, AVIC uh, Chengdu. Um, they took on more of the responsibility for procurement, customer relationship management, um, and what it did was it put AVIC International into more of a distribution type of role uh, with the international suppliers. So I think this is an important uh, change for a lot of companies to pay attention to, especially distributors. Um, and it shows how some of these strategic changes in the group strategy of AVIC were reacted to by foreign OEMs and by AVIC internally. The next component of AVIC strategy is called uh, Wuhua. And this means five changes that are needed to achieve the long-term goals that they set. So we won't talk about all of them, but these five changes are market-oriented reforms, specialization, corporate governance, internationalization, and uh, industrialization. So we'll look at specialization and what that means. What AVIC is doing is they have been restructuring the group over the last two years, two, about two or three years. And they're creating centers of excellence for things such as helicopters in Tianjin, uh, UAVs in Guizhou, general aviation aircraft, Zhuhai, uh, transport aircraft. You might be thinking, why is transport aircraft in Shanxi? You have to remember that Comac and AVIC are not the same company. In the end, they're owned by the same government, they're state-owned companies, but they're under different management. They have different, somewhat different objectives. Um, and Shanxi really is, uh, it's a place where China has a lot of experience with the, uh, the Y8, the Y9. Um, they have their own turboprop programs, which uh, Mario just elaborated on. Uh, and also they're the major subcontractor for the C919 program uh, with the wing box uh, center fuselage. Uh, they inherited a lot of this capability from subcontracting work they did with uh, Boeing and Airbus. Uh, so that's why we put transport aircraft under Shanxi. 
engines. This is in Shanghai. So there's a new company called ACAE, uh, established in 2009. They're developing commercial aircraft engines. We'll talk about them a little bit later in the presentation. And then there are also system uh, level center of excellences which they're trying to develop in different parts of the country. Now, it's important, especially in this part of the presentation, to realize that in China, what the person at the top says, it filters down to the bottom. So you will hear, if you speak Chinese, you will hear all of the senior managers of the AVIC companies repeating verbatim this uh, strategy. But that doesn't mean that there is no resistance. In fact, there is really strong resistance to a lot of these uh, strategies. For example, Tianjin, uh, AVIC Harbin does not want to move all of their production to Tianjin, and uh, Jingde Zhen does not want to move all of their R&D capabilities to Tianjin either. So there are a lot of uh, areas of resistance uh, to the strategy that's being implemented at the top level of AVIC because it's such a large organization, these become very significant. And the final component of this strategy is called Wan Yi, and Wan Yi means one trillion in Chinese, and this is their sales target in Chinese Yuan uh, for 2020. So in order for them to reach the 2020 sales target, they have to have consistent 25% growth over the next eight years. So assuming that the renminbi continues to appreciate at <clears throat> the rate it's been doing in the last uh, few years, this would be about 195 billion US dollars in revenue. So where will this growth come from? Well, there's gonna be two main areas that we expect it to come from. The first is all of these domestic programs such as the C919, new helicopter programs, general aviation programs, uh, turboprops, and so on, uh, coming online in the next five to 10 years. Uh, the second is external growth from outbound M&A. In the last few years, we've seen some very significant acquisitions by AVIC. Uh, the first major one being FACC, uh, Austrian company, who's now one of the major suppliers on the C919. Uh, then there's acquisitions such as Cirrus aircraft, Epic aircraft, Continental engines. They're taking time to digest these acquisitions right now, but we expect that they've learned a lot from them and they're gonna continue uh, to make uh, acquisitions as they're permitted by the US government or Europe to do so. So that concludes the first part of our presentation. The second, we're gonna go through an outlook on civil aircraft, uh, civil aircraft engines and uh, business aviation. So we'll first start with civil aircraft. And for this part, we're gonna focus on C919 program. Uh, right now, the C919 is entering a very critical stage in its development. Uh, they are expecting the deadline is to finish the detailed design by the end of the year. However, as I'm sure a lot of you have heard, there are numerous problems and difficulties in getting these uh, joint ventures and the joint ventures are supplying most of the major systems for the C919 online in time to reach the uh, COMAC deadlines. We're hearing anywhere between one to three years, sometimes even more. Uh, and so what does that mean for the program? Well, we expect that in 2014, there will certainly be uh, a first flight. However, that doesn't indicate that they're gonna be able to certify the aircraft within two years after that. Um, we expect that COMAC will uh, rely a lot more on the foreign partners in the joint ventures and on their international supply chains as opposed to trying to localize too much of the production uh, in the early stages of the C919 program. This may give them a better chance in the program coming off uh, coming online sometime in like a 2017, 2018 maybe. 
So we're watching this carefully, um, but the order book still continues to increase. They had 20 orders at the Singapore Air Show from a Chinese leasing company just a few weeks ago. And uh, the other program which we can talk about maybe in the Q&A if we have time is the Air J21, because this will affect uh, the C919 as well. Um, then there's civil aircraft engines. So the new civil aircraft engine program is the CJ-1000A. It was uh, announced not very long ago. Um, it will equip the C919. Uh, right now, they're in the development phase. They're trying to develop a, de a demo engine that will be based on already existing engine technologies. They've already started uh, some prototype production with suppliers, and projects will continue over the next uh, four years in order to be able to produce a demo engine. From 2016 to 2020, they're expecting to uh, perform the core test and work on the certification of the, of the engine. And there's, uh, their goal is to enter to service by 2021. It's really early to say uh, whether or not this will be possible. Um, if you haven't started working with this company on this program, there's definitely, uh, it's still a good time to get involved and there's a lot they need help with. The last part of the outlook is general and business aviation. In emerging economies, we look at um, two main driving forces. The first being increasing affluence of the population. So we track per capita GDP growth. And then the second being removal of government restrictions and infrastructure development. So as you can see, China, and we all know China is becoming more and more wealthy. It's moving along the right axis here. However, it still is even worse than India in terms of general aviation penetration in the market. Now, we know that the aerospace, the airspace has been closed. Uh, however, they have already begun to roll out uh, some pilot test zones for the airspace opening. And we expect this to continue over the next five years. Um, another important change that's going to remove some barriers is investment in airports and infrastructure. So we can expect to see a continued, and we already have seen, a continued increase in general aviation activity in China. So the growth has already started, um, and there is a strong demand for general aviation services, and a lot of it is latent demand, and really the biggest problem right now is in the infrastructure of China's general aviation industry. So this is our forecast on the uh, general aviation fleet in China. Right now, this uh, forecast, by the way, includes helicopters and fixed-wing aircraft together. Right now the fleet is just over a thousand aircraft. Um, we expect most of the growth to occur starting in 2017. And the main reason for this is that by then there will be a uh, proper opening of the airspace. Um, there will be time to roll out some of the infrastructure that's needed in order to sustain that kind of growth. Um, however, China is not, uh, there's nothing that is 100% certain, so we have three different forecasts on there. And the worst case scenario, uh, if the airspace for whatever reason becomes closed off or does not open up, we can expect there will be not very significant growth at all in the market finishing at under 10,000 aircraft by 2020. What does this mean for manufacturing of general aviation aircraft in China? Well, there's two trends you can take away from this graph here. Uh, interestingly, rotor wings manufacturing activity is uh, currently larger than fixed wing in China. We expect that to change uh, around 2015. 
and we expect to see uh, a strong increase in general aviation manufacturing activity from 2017 on as some of the programs from Kaiga uh, come online. And last, let's conclude with a few uh, assessments of some of the opportunities in China and some of the risks that aerospace companies face when doing business in the country. So one of the things you can do as a manufacturer is try to look at the manufacturing capabilities of the country and the market as a whole. What you can do is identify areas of weakness and what are the relevant product lines you might have that you could bring to China. Um, a second area of interest would be general, the general aviation ecosystem. So there's a very big need right now for infrastructure, services around GA, and in general just know-how. The concept is not really well understood yet. If you've ever gone to a general aviation airport, which there are very few in China, you'll see that they really don't have a good understanding of what GA is all about. This, of course, will change with time, uh, but for those companies that are able to get in and be a part of that, they stand to potentially benefit a lot from being involved in the Chinese aviation market. So really, you should evaluate your strategic options. Um, we see a lot of companies coming to China, and they all tend to make Many of them make some very similar mistakes. Uh, with aerospace, it's even more difficult because we're in an industry which is very regulated. It's a strategic industry in China. Uh, there's a very secretive culture with many of the companies in the industry, especially on the manufacturing side. So it's not a very easy, un in, an easy market to understand and to navigate. Some of the problems can be avoided uh, if you uh, don't go with, uh, for example, the first company that seeks you out, this is a very common uh, mistake which people do. Um, also, you want to be careful who you take your advice from. Uh, there's a lot of China experts out there, but really you should deal with professionals who understand the industry and understand the market. So, uh, you know, making some of these mistakes really magnifies the risk of IP theft, problems with the joint venture, legal issues down the road. A lot of this can be avoided if you follow a proper strategic uh, approach to the Chinese market. What we recommend is that you first evaluate what is the right value proposition to bring to China. Uh, then you need to assess what are the capabilities that are needed in order to execute that in China. What do you already have? Uh, what are your capability gaps? Maybe one of them is spelling. <laughs> uh, <laughs> how are you going to fill those gaps? And then the blank slide here is uh, finding the right partner so or partners. So instead of going from number six, which is the partner comes and finds you, then you figure out all the rest. You start in a logical, strategic order. So this is what we recommend to reduce your risk when coming to the Chinese market, aviation market. So uh, thank you for your attention. Um, if we don't have enough time in the Q&A to address all of your questions or you prefer to ask a question in private, uh, please feel the free to find me or one of my three colleagues. Uh, we have a booth over there on the right. Um, but yeah, I'd like to open up for questions. Yeah, if that's okay with you. Sure. Thank you, Todd. We have one here first. Hey, Todd. Kevin Michaels. I, I want to ask you this goal of a hunt. You, you don't have to defend this, but $195 billion, the entire value of aircraft production this year, as any casual reader of Teal Group would see, is $130 billion. What, what do they have in mind? Where did they get this goal from? Well, you have to consider that uh, Avic Group, their company, which is uh, 400,000 people, uh, not all of their activities are in 
aircraft manufacturing. Um, actually, a lot of their activities are in things like automotive, uh, real estate. Um, pretty much they touch everything in China. So uh, much like another, much like other large conglomerates, they, uh, they, you know, they have a lot of areas which they could, which they could grow. So uh, I wouldn't relate that directly to uh, aircraft manufacturing values, but that will be a large uh, portion of their growth. Um, if you want more information about their split between uh, aviation and uh, non-aviation manufacturing, I'd be happy to give you some more detailed information on that. Take one over here. Hey, Todd. Dale Carlson, GE and CFM. Question for you. On the earlier chart, you showed governance uh, or some concept of governance under AVEC. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you care to comment on the uh, principle of governance? Is it uh, entirely consistent with those who desire action through WTO for, uh, re you know, resolvement of grievances and so on? Or where do you see the trajectory of their view of governance going? Thank you. All right. Um, what they really mean by improving corporate governance is uh, I think AVIC right now has something like 20 listed companies on the various uh, Chinese exchanges. They want to list more and more of their companies on those exchanges. So in order to do that, they need to improve their corporate governance. Uh, and I would say they will do it with Chinese characteristics like they do many other things. So uh, this will, I wouldn't say it's in context of WTO, but it's more so they have their own interests in listing companies on Chinese stock exchanges. That's where, that's where they're going with that point. You have one over here? Yeah, Mario Robles with MPC Industries. Hi. Where, where is the, uh, for Chinese run companies, where is the management talent, the leadership skills, where's the executive experience and insight coming from to, to manage and pull off such ambition plans. And I'm, I'm not being critical, I'm being more inquisitive. I know in the U.S. we have high school, college and university, mm -hmm. master's degrees programs, mm -hmm. management training programs. How, how are the ch Chinese run companies? How, how, what does that look like? Wh how, where are the managers coming from? Good question. Uh, if you spend time with any of these companies and you spend time with their senior management, they're going to be very humble and they'll say management is our biggest weakness or one of our biggest weaknesses. Um, I think that uh, they do, you know, the first step to resolving uh, the problem is to acknowledge it. And uh, it's definitely an opportunity for those people who are able to improve management uh, capabilities especially in an aerospace context. Um, they have MBA programs more and more in China. I mean, uh, schools such as Harvard and uh, there's many, many uh, educational institutions that are investing in China because they identify that management is a key issue in many industries, not just the aviation industry, especially with state-owned organizations. Um, but if you follow uh, over the last even five years, just watching how they make presentations, how they, how they present themselves, uh, how they think about strategy, there's always, every year, signs of improvement. So uh, it's definitely uh, one of their weak spots, management, but they're looking for ways to improve it. And one of the ways that they they really often try to improve it is by going into joint venture. So they'll say, well, what, what do you, they'll say, what do you want from our side? The foreigner will ask, what do you want from our side in the joint venture? A lot of times they'll say management, uh, management technique, management, uh, improving, improving management. So this is definitely uh, an area of interest for China. Okay, can you, one more right here? Oh, excuse me, go ahead. Matt, go ahead. Uh, Matt from Panasonic. Can you elaborate a little bit more on the, the over here? Oh, okay. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on the relationship between AVIC and COMAC? Okay, sure. Uh, AVIC does have shares in COMAC, um, but the relationship between uh, COMAC 
and AVIC is mainly that of a supplier. So AVIC is the major uh, tier one supplier of COMAC. For air structures, uh, Xi'an, Shenyang, uh, Chengdu, Hongdu, uh, these are some of the major air structure suppliers, and there's no joint venture uh, for those um, companies to supply the C919 program. Then there are systems. So AVIC has, uh, has many systems manufacturers, or at least components of these systems. And if we go back to that, sl that slide where I showed the various divisions in AVIC, um, they restructured the company over the last three years in order to be able to provide system level capabilities to, to a C919 program. Uh, so it's really more of a supplier or supplier uh, relationship, uh, but they're very closely linked. You know, they hold they hold uh, a minority share in Comac itself, um, although the majority of shares in Comac are owned by the state-owned assets commission, um, by uh, local uh, the Shanghai government, um, and by some other uh, stakeholders in the industry. Does that answer your question? Okay, Mike, this will be our last question. Mike, go ahead. Mike Yates with TAC there. Um, right there. Right here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You'd mentioned earlier uh, ARJ21. What, is, what do you see for the future of that, of that program? Okay, so a lot of people think the ARJ21 is a dead program. Um, we don't think it's a dead program. Uh, they are moving along in the certification process, although they met very big delays and challenges of that. I mean, they originally wanted the aircraft to be already in service by now for, for years. So uh, as of, uh, as of uh, I think, a, a couple months ago or a couple weeks ago, they, uh, they started certification flight testing. Uh, they're projecting or they're hoping to certify the aircraft by uh, early next year. So this program, uh, this program is also uh, very important for the C919 because it is one of the programs which the FAA is conducting its shadow certification on. So uh, for those of you that uh, don't know what is a shadow certification, basically the CAAC is conducting, is auditing COMAC, who is producing the C91, uh, the ARJ21, and the FAA is following them to watch how they do so. So at the end of this, the CAAC will make a conclusion on the ARJ21 and say, no, we don't certify the aircraft, or yes, we do. It doesn't actually matter if they say we certify it or not, but the FAA will validate that the process that they went through was uh, correct or not. And if they validate it, that means that the bilateral can potentially be expanded between China and the U.S. And this has major implications for uh, COMAC with the C919 and for China in general with all of its aircraft programs. So it's very, it's important to not forget about the ARJ21 and to at least keep an eye on what's going on with that program. All right. Thank you. It was very well done, Todd. Thank you. Thank you.